Thank you very much, Keller um, Group, for this four mad event. Very nice. Thank you all for attending, and thank you all the panelists uh, around me to have an interesting discussion. Let me briefly introduce them. Um, I won't make it long because I could stay hours talking about them. They have a wealth of experience. Actually, I feel a bit, uh, not embarrassed, but uh, overwhelmed with such a great um, experience around the table. But let me say that I have uh, Guy Selfs with me. He's the uh, SVP for Luxury Hotels yeah. in Minor. Yeah. I also have um, Philippe Boyang. Uh, he's an institution in this, in this industry. I think we all know him. <laughs> His uh, CV is so long that uh, you never end it. Uh, he's actually a senior advisor for Cointia, but uh, also working with other projects that he will tell us later. And then um, Jose... Ignacio? Jorge Ignacio, Nacho, sorry. <laughs> Sanchez Butragueño, coming from, from uh, Brain Trust. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Before we jump into discussions, let me um, introduce a bit the, the scene, so set up the, the scene, uh, at least uh, for luxury hotels, okay? Luxury hospitality, which is what we're talking about here in the, the next 45 minutes, actually 33 minutes. We have jumped uh, quickly from 45 to 33. Yeah. I'm amazed how there time goes. Go. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so, let me go quickly through this. Um, Madrid uh, Luxury Hospitality has done the biggest jump in the last years, growing up to 2,700 uh, rooms in, in luxury hotels uh, with some uh, refurbishments uh, and uh, new openings um, from Santo Mauro, Mandarin, Rosewood, JW Marriott coming into town, or the Hotel Montera uh, Curio Collection by Hilton. So that's a big jump and interesting for Madrid. Um, if we look also at the international scene, we can see that um, luxury travel or luxury hotels are having a, a good uh, performance. Actually, they have already surpassed uh, the 2019 ADRs by far, especially in Europe. I think uh, they are above like 30, 30s, 40s percent above 2019. That's very good performance. Of course, that uh, steep increase is difficult to maintain, so in the last months, at least uh, from... Sorry, I haven't introduced myself. Um, excuse me for that. My name is Pablo Sanchez, I work for Mirai, and we work uh, for enabling the direct sales for hotels. So we work with hotels to make them able to sell directly to hotels with um, booking engine, website, marketing, digital marketing, call center, and, uh, of course, any strategy and, and consultancy that they need. Anyways, looking at our data, we, we have like more than 3,000 hotels in our platform, actually sort of leaders in, in Spain and a couple of markets. We see that um, the um, luxury hotels, they're still growing, but they have slowed their pace. Of course, it was very, very difficult to maintain that big uh, increase, um, but still, growing um, ADRs in these last months by, by 3%. Also, the average booking window, which is actually now a bit larger than, than before, uh, up to 71 days, for, for me, is, is quite a, a long average booking window. But on the other hand, the stay is a bit shorter, um, at least shorter than, than last year, which, of course, is difficult to compare because last year we had this champagne effect. So is when we compare to 2022, sometimes it's not so fair. But at least um, when we compare, the, the average uh, length of stay is only 3.2, a little lower than, than before. And what it really um, called my attention was that comparing to the rest of uh, standard hotels, all the rest of the hotels, the mobile proportion of, of reservations was lower. So only 24% compared to 30, 27, sorry, compared to 34. So lower proportion of mobile, I guess also is related to a higher basket value and uh, booking value that uh, the needs uh, uh, to, to make sure certain things before purchasing. Anyways, when we look at uh, Madrid hotels in terms of markets, uh, of course, you all know this, but uh, let me point out that the uh, United States, at, at least in the data we see, uh, is the king, is the king market. Uh, they are <coughs> having around 38% of the, of the sales that, uh, in luxury uh, hotels uh, for the capital, and they are growing in every, you know, all the categories. So they have the highest ADR, the average booking window, the, one of the highest uh, length of stay, 
but the lowest mobile share, only 17%. So 24 for the luxury, only 17 for the uh, Madrid luxury hotels. Something that um, calls my attention. On the other side, uh, we have uh, UK and Mexico that uh, are pushing up and they are growing a lot. So uh, that's some markets to, to, um, to look at. And then let me finish with the demand before we jump into the trends. So demand is very healthy for Madrid hotels. It's actually increasing, and this is data from Google Travel Analytics for the last 12 weeks, and they oversee the whole online, uh, of course, only on online uh, demand, but it's a great part of the demand, and I, I think it's, uh, it's reflecting what the reality is. Um, it's increasing 12% versus last year, and also increasing 26% versus the previous period, which would be the 12 weeks before the last 12 weeks. And by country, um, Spain is still the largest for across the industry, all the hotels in Madrid, not only luxury. They, I, can, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't make that selection for only luxury hotels, but for the whole uh, community, for all Madrid uh, hotels, it's growing um, only 6%, but still the largest uh, by far uh, compared to the rest of the market. But US and UK are the top three and they are increasing a lot. They are increasing much more than the domestic demand. They are increasing 37% compared to the um, previous year. So now let's jump into the trends and then let's um, discuss about them. And let me start with the, um, the trend about the personalized experience, or personalized and exclusive experiences. How do you think this trend is evolving in the luxury um, hospitality? So, Giles, how do you see this? I think it's... It's always been important in the luxury space of that course, yes. the personalization is one of the main factors why people come and, and stay with you. But I think now it's being taken to further heights by all of the brands that are in the space. Um, digital is obviously playing a really important part of that and the way that we start to use technology to be able to take personalization even further. Um, whether that be through hotel apps, whether we start looking at how we use AI to do that, you know, facial recognition and biometrics, and where do we go from hotel keys and moving for, moving away from those? I mean, the, the, the personalization is, is endless from that perspective. But at the end of the day, the customer is looking for us as a luxury hotelier to make them feel unique, special, and different in all the ways that we interact with them so that they feel that they are a person within the hotel environment rather than somebody who's staying there who isn't recognized, who isn't known, um, who the team don't create personal connections with to be able to go above and beyond for what the guest is looking for. Totally right. But the, the, the exp I would like to outline the experience word here because I think this is quite important. Um, Philip, you are quite into the experience world. Actually, you're working on a very nice experiential uh, initiative. Uh, let us yeah, know. I think we should first of all ask ourselves, what are we competing for in the luxury space, right? Are we competing for the material things? Are we competing for the best bed, for the best shower, for the best amenities, for the best furniture, for the best whatever in the room? No, we're not, because the guests that are paying a thousand euros today at the Four Seasons, at the Ritz, at Villa Magna here in Madrid, they have all that at home. So we're not competing for that. We're competing for service delivery and service excellence. What do you need for service delivery and service excellence? People. Excellent people. Competent people. Confident people, right? That know what they're doing. How do you get those people? You hire the right people. Once you hire the right people and you've trained them, you support them and you empower them and you don't, and you don't try and control them, right? We should be there to inspire them, to give them a purpose to rally around, right? Purpose for me is the heart of the business. Profit is the reward we get for creating a motivating environment for our staff so they look after our guests. And without that, you cannot get personalized experiences. Because personalized experiences are emotional connections that are made with people, not with anything else. And when you make those emotional connections between the employees and the guests, and you do that consistently well, that's how you create loyalty. Loyalty is not for sale. Loyalty doesn't work with points and miles. 
That's convenience, that's not loyalty. Loyalty, you have to earn it. And you earn it with emotional connections, time after time, consistently. Totally agree, what a great point, that's it. Yes, this is at the core of the industry, people and emotions. And I, I remember something um, my, one of my previous bosses used to say is that um, hospitality is the industry of happiness. It's true. It's where you live experiences, where you are actually happier than ever done in your, at least the rest of the day-to-day uh, -day, um, life. But to have a great experience and a happy stay in a hotel, you need motivated stuff, happy stuff, which is at the core of what you're saying. And we'll touch it later because it's one of the challenges that the industry is facing. Yep. Jose Nathan, what do you think? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to add more um, uh, different perspective uh, because Gilles and, and, and Philip uh, said very, very interesting points about, about personalization. I would only say a couple of things more. It's that there is kind of debate between uh, digitalization or personalization and, and, and we believe that this is, I mean, that, that question is not properly, uh, 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 properly uh, uh, given no? uh, because at the end of the day, um, digitalization is an, or the, the technology is an enabler, um, but not the objective. Uh, uh, and and we, we need to understand technology as, as a, uh, a mean um, to, to, um, to achieve what is the core of the business, as Philip was saying, which is uh, create uh, unforgettable experiences and, and to generate emotions. Um, and therefore, um, adding a little, uh, uh, I mean, thinking a bit uh, uh, ahead, uh, we, we could say that the new luxury uh, is going to be um, human touch. Uh, after pandemic, we, we can see very clear how the, the expenditure on, on, uh, on experiences is, is growing much faster than, than materials. And this is a clear example of what, what human being is looking for. A human being is looking for emotions, for experiences. Um, so if, if we connect all, all these uh, perspectives um, um, and we use them in a smart way, uh, we all agree no, that, that uh, technology uh, should be understood as an enabler um, to understand customer needs in every single uh, uh, contact point during, during, the, during the customer uh, journey and, and then to support a perfect or an, an unforgettable uh, experience uh, that we, that, that's the core of our business, no? that's, that's our vision. Yeah, that's clear. Um, technology is one of, one of the trends, of course, and we have all heard about um, AI and initiatives like ChatGPT and how it's helping, of course, a lot in the commercialization and the, in the selling process and, and customizing things for the customer and, and, and with bots and, and, and so on and so on. But as um, Philip was saying, this is a human service, face-to-face um, -face, uh, business and um, we have to use it as a tool, but we have to concentrate in the service delivery. That's, that's clear. But let me get to another trend that is important, is sustainability. And um, I was reading this about um, small luxury hotels of the world, this initiative, um, which is the um, Considerate Collection. It's a very interesting initiative, which is based in, in three pillars, which is um, the hotels are um, community-minded, they are cultural custodians and then are environmentally conscious. What do you think about this? How is, for example, Minor taking this into account when, when developing I think, their... I think it's more than just sustainability. I think it's about corporate social responsibility sure. and sustainability is one part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but if we look at what we want to try and do um, within the local community, that needs to be an awful lot about where our focus is. So. In, in the destinations that we are, the hotels play very important part in people's lives, both from the employment that they give, the education opportunity they have, mm -hmm. the development that they can give to, to the people to be able to grow the income of their families and provide them with 
an effective future? Um, and how do we look at giving back to that community as part of that? And when we talk about sustainability, we, typically in the hotels we talk about you know, how do we reduce the amount of power that we consume or how do we install solar panels or um, reduce water consumption and things like that. But this, to me, is a much bigger question than, than that part of it. How do we work with local orphanages or um, local charities to be able to provide them with um, support and resources that they don't have? How can the team go out into, the, into those areas and teach people another language other than the local language because the team in the hotels will have access to that skill set? What do we do in terms of how we use our leftover food? Um, you know, food waste is a massive issue globally right now. Um, and in a lot of luxury hotels, typically there is a significant amount of food waste. How do we work with the local communities to make sure that that food doesn't go to waste? Um, how do we do that? So I think it's, it's more than just the sustainability part and much more about how do, how, do the, how do our hotels take a central stage in the local community to make sure that they are able to support and develop that community for the bettering of the environment that it's in. Yeah, and the work with the, with the, guests, the guests is also interesting, because not only what you do, but what you transmit and communicate to the guests, because you're sort of leading by example, and the guests also have to be part of the equation and integrate with the community. So if we all do it properly, it can be a, a long-run, interesting solution. I actually like a lot the, the claim of the considerate collection. They say they stay small, stay considerate. It's actually a, a, nice, a nice claim. Philip, what do you think about that? I completely agree with Jill. Very well said. Uh, I think it's all about the community. I think it's about what happens outside the hotel more than what happens inside the hotel today. 20 years ago, we tried to keep our customers prisoner <laughs> in our hotel because we wanted to, to spend every penny in the hotel. <laughs> Today, we are facilitators, hotels. We are responsible for showing the client the best the destination has to offer, right? Sustainability, I think, is all about community, exactly like Jill said. Uh, get the support of the community because they will support your hotel every day of the year. They are not normal clients. If you get a community to support you and to like you, then they will come for their special occasions, for their birthdays, for their weddings, etc. And they will support your hotels all the time. But what's even more important is the experience. And I think the local community provides, and that's what we should be doing as hotels, introduce our guests to characters, personalities, interesting local people that know about the culture, etc. When I was in Peru for Orient Express, our biggest and most successful activity was to invite guests to select two or three families in Cusco, for example, and invite the guests to go and have dinner with the local family, with their kids and their pets and God knows what. And they loved that, right? And we paid the, the local family, but the guests came back. I mean, they were inspired, right? Because you're sitting there with a top guide or a professor or a musician or a, a writer, and they tell you more about the local uh, culture than you have ever heard. So those are the kind of things we need to be creative enough to be able to provide to the guests. But sustainability, the last thing I want to say, I think sustainability in the hotel, like Gilles said, it's all about the amenities and plastic free, etc. We can all do that. But it's more important for the staff than for the guests. We all say the guests are asking, you need to be more sustainable, etc. When I speak to top hoteliers, they say, well, we hardly ever got a guest that asks us, what are we doing on the sustainability front? However, the younger generation of employees, they're asking you the question in the interview. And by the way, when you interview one of these young people, I sometimes think that I'm being interviewed myself, right? Because these guys have questions like you wouldn't believe, but they are the ones that are asking, what are you doing to make the world a better place? What's your company policy on sustainability, etc.? That's a great story. That's, that's the way it should go. And actually, I think that um, when a hotel establishes in, a new, in, in, in any area, the local community has to see the hotel as a, as a great benefit for the community. So that's the, the final objective of the, of the hotel, mm -hmm. to be able to transmit and to get a genuine sentiment from the people that they love that hotel because it brings 
wealth and prosperity to the region, not only tourist and, 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 and the bad things of tourism. Mm. So that's, that's the goal. Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree with, with you all. Uh, I, I would say three, three things. Uh, first is that I, I, or we don't consider that sustainability is a concrete uh, trend for, for luxury. I th we, we believe it's, it's a global trend. Mm -hmm. and, and the question is how luxury uh, can uh, um, provide something different to sustainability compared to other industries or compared to other segments. And in, in this sense, we think there, there are clear examples of, of the impact of luxury on, on sustainability. For instance, the focus on quality instead of quantity in, 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 in big cities or in certain destinations, or um, uh, the, the, a bigger possibility to, uh, to, uh, to offer decent jobs and, and, and proper salaries to, to the community. So there, there are many things uh, to, to consider uh, about luxury in terms of uh, the impact for, for sustainability. But again, uh, we, we don't believe it's, it's, a, it's a, a specific trend for, for luxury, but a global, a, a global trend. On top of that, um, from, from the customer perspective, uh, we think that the, the, um, the challenge is how to put sustainability in action. This is the key question that most of, of companies are, are, are doing. And uh, I would say a couple of, uh, of Examples, so a good example and a bad example. A good example would be um, some companies that are starting to show, to, first of all, to track the impact in terms of energy saving, uh, environmental uh, impact, and so on. Track it, track it, show it to the customer, and reward the customer in terms of discounts or in terms of loyalty points just because uh, the impact on, on certain uh, um, uh, actions during the stay. This is a way where the companies can really impact on sustainability. And we have to recognize that there are uh, still today um, uh, bad practices. I, I remember um, one month ago, I was in the Dominican Republic, um, I, I, and I could, I could see how an American brand uh, was uh, uh, developing uh, a value proposition which Honestly, uh, we don't believe it's, it's supporting uh, um, sustainability. Just to transport a pure North American value proposition to Dominican Republic. So w we wonder what kind of, uh, of strategy is that that is putting the, in, in, I mean, in, in the middle of, of the value proposition what the customer has in, in the feeder market. So is, is that helping to develop the, the local culture, to develop the, uh, the 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 lo I mean the, the mm, uh, let's say the, the the essence of the destination, <coughs> no, not at all, not at all, and we need to to um, um, to be in, uh, against this this kind of uh, practices, honestly. Sure. So there's still a lot of greenwashing that uh, has to we have we to, need to over put in action and do sustainability it as many others are doing. Actually. Moving from from just saying it to do it, so we need execution sure. in in that sense. Let me jump to another trend and then we'll jump into the, the challenges because we have a few challenges to, to comment and opportunities. But the last trend I would like to talk about is privacy and exclusivity. Um, and I think we have a, a couple of good examples that, that we can comment uh, on the table. How do you see? Oh, I throw it to, to, the, to, to all the panel. Please go ahead and throw some examples of how you are dealing with exclusivity and privacy. I think I think part of the, the the conversation in the luxury space is what does privacy and exclusivity actually mean, and it's it's language that we use a lot, and in this space, it's different every single time, because when you have a guest who's paying you one, two, three, five thousand euros a night, every single one of those people will have a different view of what privacy and exclusivity means to them. And to the point that we were talking about earlier in terms of creating those experiences, you as the luxury deliverer of that have to be able to understand very quickly what that person is looking for and act on it and act against it. Um, you know, I, the question that I often get asked the most is what are the craziest things or the strangest things that people have asked you for in, in your hotel career? And, and, and my response is, I don't think anything that a guest asks for 
is crazy or strange because every person is an individual and every person has their own needs and wants and our role in the luxury space is to deliver against that. So if one person wants to have the windows boarded up because they don't want any light in their room, that's up to them. If that's their view of how they can create their perfect privacy experience for them in their suite. Is it for me to judge that that's the right thing to do? Absolutely not. My role is to facilitate what they are looking for, and it ties back to the experience. And you, you have to understand what your guest is looking for and what your guest wants. And then you have to act on it individually every single time because what you think is of as privacy or exclusive is very different to everybody else in this room. And if we try and commoditize it and make it the same for everybody else and misunderstand the need of that customer, actually you're devaluing the way that you try and deliver that service for the guest. Oh. Yes. Vince, so how are you landing that? Everybody talks about these uber personalized and, and exclusive experiences, but how do you do that when you have a 150, 200 bedroom hotel, which is full in the summer? How are you going to produce that personal exclusive experience for every room? It's impossible. So let's start where it counts. That is the stuff, right? Let's start first by hiring the right people Let's start by taking care of them. That means of their basic needs, because a lot of the hotels, and actually they did a very good job since COVID, possibly because they had to, because attracting staff after COVID was very complicated, especially good staff, because they had so many different offers. But you know, I still go into hotels and I ask myself, how is it possible? Why is it so difficult to provide a clean, neat, attractive staff entrance in the hotel, where you say to your florist, who changes your flowers twice a week or tw twice, uh, three times a week in the lobby, make me a nice vase of the flowers that we can still use, and we put it in the staff entrance, right? How many hotels are still not providing proper changing rooms, proper amenities in those changing rooms, proper towels, proper uniforms? Crisp uniform, so the staff can feel their best, right? And how many hotels are still providing a staff canteen rather than a staff restaurant? And a restaurant, staff restaurant for me, is probably the most important food and beverage outlet in the hotel, right? Once we do these things, your staff will, be, will feel valued, they will feel respected, and I can bet your bottom dollar that they will start delivering memorable moments and memorable experiences for your guests. And that's where you get, and that's what you said, that's where you get your exclusivity for the whole hotel, Correct. right? Because yeah. everybody's on the same level. I would say that um, I, I agree with Philip and, 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 and Judge once again, um, but I want to emphasize also on, on certain um, um, com confusion uh, between luxury and, and, and lifestyle, because uh, these two terms are not exactly the same. So we understand that I mean, because of the democratization of, of, of travel, um, traveling is not a luxury right now. Um, and on top of that, um, there is only 1% of millionaires around the world. And if we look at the number of five hotels, uh, star hotels that uh, exist in the world are, are more than 1%. So we, we don't conceive uh, luxury from from the from the marketing perspective or from the uh, market segmentation perspective, we don't conceive luxury as a market segment, but as a, as a status, as a socioeconomical level. On top of that, uh, we need to to deep dive a little bit on on what are the the the, the attitudes of 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 customers, um, uh, millionaires or not millionaires. Uh, and what kind of lifestyles they, they want, and then to create a specific, uh, specific um, uh, products and value propositions that they will be willing to pay uh, for it. And this is the way to increase the value of, 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 of a brand, of a destination, of a hotel, um, and to capture the, the maximum potential in terms of revenues and, and profitability. So, of course, there are 
um, uh, let's say, opulent uh, customers and show off customers and millionaires, yeah, but the opportunity is to define very precisely um, uh, concrete uh, value propositions that cover specific needs of customers, millionaires or not millionaires, uh, that are eager to, to, um, to spend money and, and, and travel um, uh, to certain, to certain um, uh, concepts. But still, you need those great, talented, motivated staff. And which brings us to the, uh, one of the challenges that we have to discuss here. How difficult it is to get the right um, talent and to retain them on the, in these days. How are you seeing uh, from your experience? Is it a problem for minor? How do you see? It, it's certainly much harder post-pandemic than it was before. I do think people's attitudes and views have changed on an awful lot of things since then. I, the important part is that the industry in general, I think, needs to review the way it behaves towards its employees. Hmm. Um, and Philippe's already said, you know, some very important points about um, about that R attracting and, reta and retaining the best talent in the luxury hospitality space right now is the biggest challenge that everybody faces. Um, and different people will have different views and thoughts on how they do it. But as an industry, we need to put a lot more energy and effort into what do we do to create a value proposition for our team members and our people mm -hmm. as much, and how do, we, how do we develop that for them? We place an awful lot of emphasis on what do we do for the customer, to develop all of that for the exactly. customer. We don't put anywhere near that much energy into developing it for our people. How many, how many luxury hotels have a staff gym? <laughs> right? You know, very, very few. Um, you know, how many hotels subsidize education or training mm -hmm. for their team members, whether it be um, you know, language or technology or whatever it is. Uh, you know, what do we do from a, from a transportation perspective? It, it's, not, it's not all about the salary, which is where I think a lot of people tend to focus. There's an awful lot of things around the salary that hotels can do very easily at a very cost-effective way to create a value proposition for the team members to make them want to come work either for your company or for the industry as a whole. Um, and I don't think we're doing enough. We are obsessed um, with the customer satisfaction and we don't even know the employee satisfaction. So yeah, you're totally right. I think most, peop most people now have employee satisfaction and, and, but, it's, but it's a case of how do you take that information mm -hmm. and how do you act on it and use it to make sure that you continue to develop the value proposition for people to want to come work with you. But the biggest challenge I think we all face is finding the and right retaining. people and keeping them yeah. motivated and inspired to want to deliver the levels of service that we know we need to be able to deliver for our guests. It's the number, to me, it's the number one challenge over the next 18 and months. Like Jill, like Jill just said, I mean, the most important is that the staff journey today is as important as the guest experience, right? And so we need to, as general managers, we need to look at both things. But I think what is even more important is how do we deal with the younger generation? The younger generation, not mm. very complicated, mm. not, not very complicated, <laughs> very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I Even mean, more. they have a sense of entitlement. <laughs> they want flexibility, which in a hotel is, of course, a given. Uh, they want to be promoted within three days, right? They want money. Money is not everything. Like we said before, it's purpose. It's why do nobody comes to work in the morning to do a lousy job. Nobody comes to work to be negative. They come to contribute to a purpose, contribute to each other. They want to grow in responsibility. And most important, they want to be rewarded for their achievements, right? Recognized, recognized and recognized. rewarded for their achievements. That's the most important thing. But the younger generations, yes, they might have different demands and they might have different uh, attributes, but if we don't adapt, then there is no way in hell that we can attract young, talented people ever again. So we have to adjust, right? And even though it's difficult and creating that flexibility, but flexibility also doesn't have to mean they have to work two days from home. We can create flexibility in many other ways, right? But that for me is the big challenge. 
And the third one is education. And I think all of us that are directly involved with hospitality have responsibility to go and speak to students every year about hospitality, not only in hotel universities, but in normal schools from a young age, from 12, 13, 14, get them excited because it is a fantastic profession, guys. It's a fantastic job. Get them excited about it. Teach them about it. And when the time comes when they have to make a decision, hopefully they will go into an apprenticeship, so they go into a vocational hotel school because our future management is not coming from the hotel universities. Eh? Those are business schools now. They're not hospitality schools anymore. They're business schools. Mm. So think that you're going to get 10% of those, maybe, in the hospitality, because they all want to be in finance, in marketing, and technology, etc. So I think our solution for the staffing crisis will come from the younger generations. You're and totally it's right. our responsibility to nurture We have to generate that demand, that, that willingness to become yeah. a hotelier, yeah. Yeah. because we have so many people in Spain that want to be engineer, or they want to be whatever economy is, have a business, but nobody says that they want to be hoteliers. Mm. And it's 15% well, it's of, the, of the GDP and, and growing, or 20%, so we need more people wanting to be hoteliers. I, I totally agree, and I would like to emphasize one of the points that uh, Philip mentioned. I said that we, we, uh, we need to, uh, to make the hospitality bright since, since, the, since the very beginning, uh, when, when people are, are uh, when the students are in the, even in, in, in the school, uh, just showing how, how, I mean, how happy you can be uh, by offering uh, happiness to, to others. The happiness industry. Because it, yeah. as, as Rich Carlton uh, motto says, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. So it, it's something that we need to, 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 uh, to elevate and, and communicate very proudly. Uh, and on top of that, I would say that luxury uh, has probably um, I mean, a, a, an advantage, a competitive advantage versus other uh, um, segments in the sense that, yeah, um, it, it's a great opportunity to, to develop your career uh, because, yeah, I mean, it, it's easier for, for a hotel, a luxury hotel or for a luxury company to, um, to offer um, um, a most relevant uh, um, uh, professional uh, career and and and, uh, and I would say and uh, and development for, uh, a, for a human future. being. Yes. So we need to take advantage of that uh, since the very beginning. We'll do that. Well, thank you very much for for your contribution and this interesting sure. discussion. We have run out of time. This magic time that goes away very fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.